Hey there, everyone. Today we're going to be looking at The Coming Insurrection by the Invisible Committee. Now, this text was published in 2007 as Insurrection qui vient, and obviously because it's titled uh, by the Invisible Committee, we don't exactly know who these people are. Um, it is suspected that the authors are the Tarnak Nine. Um, which is a group of people, including Julien Coupa, who were arrested on the grounds that they were to have participated in the sabotage of overhead electrical lines on France's national railways. Evidence after the time of the arrest has basically eliminated them from being associated with at least that particular incident. But that's kind of a background in terms of just kind of the historical situation. They're trying to not really go by um, some sort of hidden name, but rather to do as they call an instance of strategic enunciation. So it's kind of some Deleuzean undertones. But in this text, we're going to be looking at the first circle, second circle, third circle, and all the way up to the seventh circle. These are different chapters. Um, there's an introduction, which is just kind of meh, and then there's these um, kind of final sections on organizing and on kind of more practical political responses, um, which I think are either inadequate or ambiguous or unspecific or just not very novel. So we're just going to be looking at these seven circles and seeing what's going on here. Now, one of the assumptions, or, you know, in fact, the grounds of this text is the coming of some sort of crisis. And they write here on page 14 in the introduction that crisis is a means of governing in a world that seems to hold together only through the infinite management of its own collapse. And, you know, certainly the Invisible Committee is going off of a lot of sentiments that one can feel in the air, whether it's the 2008 financial crisis or COVID or, you know, whatever it may be. There's always this feeling of, especially in the 21st century, of fighting crises, trying to stay on your feet, trying to stay out of debt and whatnot. And we see this, for example, with the colonization of the Middle East, where different catastrophes, especially 9-11, served as the grounds for increased encroachment, increased hegemony in these regions with regards to, you know, if if you're trying to find Al-Qaeda, then you can use any means necessary to infiltrate different governments, um, establish military rule and whatnot. So the way the Invisible Committee sees it, crisis is often used as a way to increase hegemony, increase control, and as such becomes the mode of governance of today. But they say something that I think is a little bit um, kind of has the Marxist naivete. It's enough just to say what is before our eyes and not to shrink from the conclusions. Now, part of me, just the philosopher who likes thinking, can look at that and say, yeah, you know, an important part of revolutionary action, of changing the world into something we like, is just being aware of the situation, of just not shrinking back from the conclusions of what we have to do. But also, just saying something doesn't actually do anything. So, there's always this kind of push and pull in this text between, okay, there's all these ramblings about alienation and, um, you know, this condition of confusion of the 21st century, but also a very unclear political target, which is not necessarily, you know, it's it, that's kind of a feature of anarchism and of insurrectionary movements. Is It's not necessarily aimed at this broad political project that's going to span like the Roman Empire's, you know, 500 years or whatever. It's, it's much more content to work in the here and now. Now, each of these circles starts with a quote that the Indivisible Community basically 
goes against and says, okay, well, this is a little bit problematic. In this first circle, the quote is, I am what I am. And really what's going on here is the invisible community is questioning an isolated, static notion of subjectivity, of what it means to be an I or a self. They write, I am what I am. My body belongs to me. I am me. You are you. And something's wrong. Mass personalization. Individualization of all conditions. Life, work, and misery. Diffuse schizophrenia. Rampant depression atomization into fine paranoiac particles, hysterization of contact. The more I want to be me, the more I feel an emptiness. The more I express myself, the more I am drained. The more I run after myself, the more tired I get. We treat our self like a boring box office. We've become our own representatives in a strange commerce, guarantors of a personalization that feels, in the end, a lot more like amputation. And this is definitely, you know, going back to that sentiment I was mentioned early, mentioning earlier, of just kind of dirging on, of trying to hold on to something that keeps me what I am in the face of, you know, increasing job insecurity or increasing inflation. So this kind of backdrop of alienation serves the text well when they continue that if society hadn't become such a definitive abstraction, then it would denote all the existential crutches that allow me to keep dragging on, the ensemble of dependencies I've contracted as the price of my identity. The handicapped are the model citizens of tomorrow." And this is very similar to a point that Jean Baudrillard makes in Symbolic Exchange and Death, which is that the notion of being handicapped carries with it a dependency which defines the modern citizen of I am tied to a society which I depend on like a social welfare program, I depend on the state to give me you know, sustenance that I wouldn't be able to work without. And as such, they're trying to wrestle with a sociability that we almost need to survive, this need to be connected, to be plugged in, with a sense of individuality that is going to be able to go beyond that sociability. And one of the important connections that they make here is that there is an injunction to identity, to mandatorily mean something, and this is very much something that Baudrillard says again in Fatal Strategies. They write, the injunction everywhere to be someone maintains the pathological state that makes this society necessary. The injunction to be strong produces the very weakness by which it maintains itself, so that everything seems to take on a therapeutic character, even working, even love. All those how's it goings that we exchange give the impression of a society composed of patients taking each other's temperature. Sociability is now made up of a thousand little niches, a thousand little refuges where you can take shelter, where it's always better than the bitter cold outside, where everything's false since it's all just a pretext for getting warmed up where nothing can happen since we're all too busy shivering silently together. And this is very much a problem in modern society, particularly of like, quote-unquote, identity politics, of, oh, I need to immediately size you up as being a member of an identity group, and I need to have a, you know, a notion already of what it means to be a part of that group, And, you know, we're always on this path to get better, to have more time for the kids, to have more money, to have more well-being or mindfulness or whatever it may be. And the way the Invisible Committee committee sees this, this need to be transparent to one another furnishes a sort of infinite condition of everyone's just shivering, trying to get by. And that notion of getting by, of course, for them is supported 
by a feeling of imminent crisis. This need to, you know, I must perform well in my job or I get fired and whatnot, this furnishes a feeling of self-subsistence of just trying to get by that the Invisible Committee says serves, you know, those in power quite well. They write here, I am what I am. Never has domination found such an innocent-sounding slogan. The maintenance of the self in a permanent state of deterioration, in a chronic state of near collapse, is the best-kept secret of the present order of things. The weak, depressed, self-critical, virtual self is essentially that endless adaptable subject required by the ceaseless innovation of production, the accelerated obsolescence of technologies, the constant overturning of social norms and generalized flexibility. It is at the same time the most voracious consumer and, paradoxically, the most productive self the one that will most eagerly and energetically throw itself into the slightest project, only to return later to its original larval state. And this sense of empty subjectivity, of just being an instrument of production, I mean, this very much has um, a sort of Marxist ring to it of Oh, we're not being treated properly, we are being neglected, we are being treated as if we only have value as producers, when in fact, you know, not only do commodities have value, but people supposedly have value. And as such, this sense of the transparency of identity, of I am what I am, and you can clearly figure that out via statistics or whatever, leads to a sense of oh, I must improve this self, I must, you know, ascribe to, maybe it's some celebrity of, oh, I must be just like them. And this leads them to write, our feeling of inconsistency is simply the consequence of this foolish belief in the permanence of the self and the little care we give to what makes us what we are. And I think this is definitely one of their most promising points is the self is contingent. It depends on a number of factors, a number of flows, a number of objects which we are willing to relegate to the status of object and thus not of ethical importance, when in fact those objects furnish our existence which we constantly try to better at the expense of those objects. And I'll mention later the environmental movement. But this can quickly get commodified, this sort of universal post-humanist optimist, like, oh, let's care for the environment. It can quickly get commodified into just a new form of production. But they write, sickness, fatigue, depression can be seen as the individual symptoms of what needs to be cured. They contribute to the maintenance of the existing order to my docile adjustment to idiotic norms and to the modernization of my crutches. And the notion of the modernization of crutches is certainly a, an interesting phrase at the very least. What is the difference between dependence, subsistency, and, you know, domination? Because a crutch can be viewed as all those different connotations of we need stuff to help us subsist. Just like they said, we give so little care to the things around us that are not us, that make us what we are, that'll, that furnish our existence. Yet it's easy to commodify that and to treat all of that as something negative which encroaches upon us. And then our sickness is the result of, you know, not being self-sufficient enough, not being productive enough. And as such, they write that the self is not something within us that is in a state of crisis. It is the form they mean to stamp upon us. They want to make our self something sharply defined, separate, accessible in terms of qualities, controllable, when in fact... We are creatures among creatures, singularities among similars, living flesh, weaving the flesh of the world. 
contrary to what has been repeated to us since childhood, intelligence doesn't mean knowing how to adapt, or if that is a kind of intelligence, it's the intelligence of slaves. Our inadaptability, our fatigue, are only problems from the standpoint of what aims to subjugate us. They indicate, rather, a starting point, a meeting point for new complicities. They reveal a landscape more damaged but infinitely more shareable than all the fantasy lands this society maintains for its purposes. Everywhere, the hypothesis of the self is beginning to crack. And this certainly has some Deleuzean connotations of, you know, the self is not this insular phenomena, it's the, the simultaneous existence of all these different flows which interact with each other and they lead to the possibility to become assimilable or the possibility for some radical change. And as such, the notion of the self as, for example, reduced to statistical behavior in like the YouTube algorithm, for example, that increasingly becomes a self by which we are defined, you know, by which we are given certain, even like welfare programs will operate more and more on statistical information of, oh, are you worthy according to such and such metrics of what we define as poverty and whatnot. So that idea of a self becomes more and more present but it really just creates a docile body that you will forever be in trying to optimize to some point which has been imposed. In the second circle, titled Entertainment is a Vital Need, they state the truth is that we have been completely torn from any belonging. We are no longer from anywhere. And the result, in addition to a new disposition to tourism, is an undeniable suffering. Our history is one of colonizations, of migrations, of wars, of exiles, of the destruction of all roots. And, you know, this to me is a very, uh, something that Paul Virilio would say, in terms of there's this increasing speed that defines modern life, of, you know, job employment tends to not last nearly as long as it used to be most um, most people cannot stay with the same job their entire lives like they used to in like the 50s or whatever because, you know, just job longevity is completely different. So there's a constant sense of decomposition which defines the increasing speed of modern society that makes it difficult to find one's ground. And in opposition to this or really accepting this and using it as a springboard, they say, in reality, the decomposition of all social forms is a blessing. It is for us the ideal condition for wild, massive experimentation with new arrangements, new fidelities. Becoming autonomous could just as easily mean learning to fight in the street, to occupy empty houses, to, seek working, to cease working, to love each other madly, and to shoplift. You know, this is like a classic anarchist statement of, well, the decomposition of society is, is exactly what we want. It testifies to the fact that um, society is crumbling under its own contradictions. This seems a little bit problematic to me in, um, in several regards, precisely because um, I don't see why the decomposition is like a constant, oh, we return to ground zero and then we come back. It seems that institutions create a historical precedent and a sort of inertia that allows them to come back more and more ready-made, more able to um, oppose autonomous organizations that may come up. So, you know, maybe it's a little bit ideal, kind of high-in-the-sky thinking, um, but it's definitely interesting in terms of thinking about what does it mean to be autonomous? Does it you know, how do we operate on a more kind of low level that doesn't have to be bureaucratic? In the third circle, titled Life, Health, and Love are Precarious, Why Shouldn't Work Be an Exception? They explain this sort of empty condition of work today when they write, 
here lies the present paradox. Work has totally triumphed over all ways of existing, as the same time as workers have become superfluous. Gains in productivity, outsourcing, mechanization, automated and digital production have so progressed that they have almost reduced to zero the quantity of living labor necessary in the manufacture of any product. We are living the paradox of a society of workers without work, where entertainment, consumption, and leisure only underscore the lack from which they are supposed to distract us. And I think this is one of the um, one of the good things about this text in comparison to like some of Marx's stuff, for example, is we are faced with different material conditions and different conditions of production, such as mechanization and automization. That totally changes what it means to be a worker today, because the majority of people living in the West are not making the majority of products necessary for their subsistence. Most of the goods that we gain, such as you know, food or kind of basic needs for building infrastructure and stuff like this, all of this is outsourced from third world countries, which allows you know corporations to escape certain labor laws or minimum wage laws or you know slavery laws. And as a result, the condition of the Western worker is such where work is more and more the way in which we live. You know, we are either at home or we are at work. And, you know, with the advent of, like, Zoom becoming so popular, home starts to become more and more like work. And as a result, we become more and more dependent on a work that doesn't actually really produce the majority of the goods that we are beholden to in terms of our survival. Most of the people aren't, you know, creating stuff in-house, like they used to. And this is not like a conservative thing of like, oh, we need to get back to that or something. The times have just changed. You know, we we live in a different economy where we don't have to have such a broad variety of goods that we have to produce in our countries because, you know, one country can be really good at exporting bananas or, you know, computer chips or something like this or some sort of precious metal and then they can import tons of other stuff from all across the world so we're left with this work which really fills a time that has totally become changed because it's not really a question of productive time in the sense of you know we're not really using this time to do much producing it's almost just a form of being occupied And really, for the Invisible Committee, it's a question of being mobilized. They write, Mobility is this slight detachment from the self, this minimal disconnection from what constitutes us, this condition of strangeness whereby the self can now be taken up as an object of work, and it now becomes possible to sell oneself rather than one's labor, to to be remunerated, not for what one does, but for what one is, for our exquisite mastery of social codes, for our relational talents, for our smile and our way of presenting ourselves. This is the new standard of socialization. Mobility brings about a fusion of the two contradictory poles of work. Here we participate in our own exploitation, and all participation is exploited. Ideally, you are yourself a little business, your own boss, your own product. Whether one is working or not, it's a question of generating contracts, abilities, networking, and short, human capital. So considering, like I said, the convergence between the work situation and the home situation, 
one's very self becomes more and more curated, you know, with your social media presence. That becomes more and more necessary to get jobs is to have a social media presence to stand out. So one is constantly curating, adapting, and making oneself marketable. So there is no longer an isolated market with consumers that come from the outside, but rather we consume and constitute social codes in one and the same action. We take with one hand what we give with the other, and this mass mobilization occurs where the market acts like a network not of commodities and producers as if they were some dichotomous poles, but producers who themselves are commodities. Commodity fetishism now takes place with the individual themselves who must, as they say, present production. So, right, production is something that you have to present as some sort of spectacle. In the fourth circle, more simple, more fun, more mobile, more secure, they elaborate on how isolation is really a dream. Integration is the reality. They write, We've heard enough about the city and the country, and particularly about the supposed ancient opposition between the two. From up close or from afar, what surrounds us looks nothing like that. It is one single urban cloth, without form or order, a bleak zone, endless and undefined, a global continuum of museum-like hypercenters and natural parks, of enormous suburban housing developments and massive agricultural products, projects, industrial zones and subdivisions, country inns and trendy bars, the metropolis. So, the metropolis is the modern instantiation of really, it's a locally integrated moment of a network-wide phenomenon. So like we've been talking about with sociability and you know marketability and the economic flowing through people, so too does this sense of civilization cross country lines you know every day borders become more and more obsolete as markets interpenetrate and burgeon more and more people have to become more and more productive you know kind of smaller countries become more and more unstable against the impeding like u.s hegemony in the middle east for example So this dichotomy between the city and the country, they don't really understand how we can uphold that anymore. And the maintaining of this situation, of the metropolis, as this kind of, again, local integration of a network-wide phenomenon, is via the armed forces, via the police. They write, The armed forces don't simply adapt themselves to the metropolis, they produce it. Thus, since the Battle of Nablus, Israeli soldiers have become interior designers, forced by Palestinian guerrillas to abandon the streets, which had become too dangerous. They learned to advance vertically and horizontally into the heart of the urban architecture, poking holes in walls and ceilings in order to move through them. An officer in the Israeli Defense Forces and a graduate in philosophy explains, the enemy interprets space in a traditional, classical manner, and I do not want to obey this interpretation and fall into its traps. I want to surprise him. This is the essence of war. I need to win. This is why we opted for the methodology of moving through walls, like a worm that eats its way forward. Urban space is more than just the theater of confrontation. It is also a means. So, right, the production and construction of spaces themselves, this is a classic Paul Virilio point, allows for domination itself. And think about the situation in Palestine right now, in the West Bank, in Gaza, 
you've got all of these interpenetrating military checkpoints that every Palestinian has to go through and get harassed. And now the IDF uses this crazy facial recognition system to integrate all the Palestinian identities into this network of associations so that they can you know, more easily integrate them into their future um, settlement plans and whatnot. So this dividing up of space and then selectively allowing permeability at certain spots acts like a worm who is able to stealthily craft a space in a way where it creates a sort of inertia. It creates paths that can be followed, but of course, you know, in this particular situation at least, many of those paths are aimed precisely to incur crises with them. And this philosophy of space leads to what Paul Virilio calls vehicles. He also calls it habitable circulation. One becomes a sort of accelerating vehicle all of their own with an inertia out of their control. They write here, hop on an inner city or commuter train, pick up a telephone, in order to be already gone. Such mobility only ever means uprootedness, isolation, exile. It would be insufferable if it weren't always the mobility of a private space, of a portable interior. The private bubble doesn't burst, it floats around. The process of cocooning is not going away, it is merely being put into motion. From a train station, to an office park, to a commercial bank, from one hotel to another, there is everywhere a foreignness, a feeling so banal and so habitual, it becomes the last form of familiarity. And this little allegory of cocooning very much exemplifies their sense of isolated subjectivity, of this individualism of, oh, I'll just, you know, it almost goes hand in hand with a sort of blind tolerance ideology of, you know, you do you, I'll do me, um, doesn't matter if you're doing something unjust, I'll just worry about being productive, being marketable, having a nice social media presence and not getting canceled not saying anything to uproot anything or ruffle any feathers. This sense of cocooning merely allows us to be pushed around, of course, by, you know, maybe it's the intelligence industry, maybe it's employers, whatever it may be. In the fifth circle, fewer possessions, more connections. They state, we have to see that the economy is not in crisis. The economy is itself the crisis. It's not that there's not enough work. It's that there is too much of it. All things considered, it's not the crisis that depresses us. It's growth. So, right, this, this condition of constantly needing to make oneself more adaptable, more economical, more frugal, they say merely bolsters integrated individuals. They kind of caricature the state and they say, don't use up our natural capital, work toward a healthy economy, avoid a social crisis that would threaten democracy and humanism. And they say, simply put, become economical. That's, that's what the state wants for people. It wants them to, you know, become better consumers so that people will start consuming themselves, basically. In the sixth circle, the environment is an industrial challenge. They speak of environmentalism. They say, we have to admit it, this whole catastrophe, which they so noisily inform us about, doesn't really touch us, at least not until we are hit by one of its foreseeable consequences. It may concern us, but it doesn't touch us, and that is the real catastrophe. And, you know, that that is certainly very true of... Environmental stuff doesn't really hit us until it hits us, you know, until we start feeling the effects of, you know, as they said, it's, it's 68 degrees in January or whatever. The very much feels like people's responses to COVID-19 of, well, it doesn't really affect me and I've got some ideology in the way of me, you know, taking the vaccine. 
or some quote-unquote health condition, which I think is often a weasel phrase for conservatives who don't want to admit they just don't care about other people, until eventually it gets to a point where you die from COVID-19. And what's weird, and you know, maybe you'll call me cynical or conniving, but maybe you'll agree with me to an extent, is when someone dies from COVID-19 because they willfully abstained from the vaccination, you know, part of me is like, well, you got what was coming for you. It was a foreseeable consequence, as the Invisible Committee writes. And, you know, that's, that's the real catastrophe, is we can be so insulated by our social environment that we aren't willing to look at stuff that's actually happening. They write, managing the phasing out of nuclear power, excess CO2 in the atmosphere, melting glaciers, hurricanes, epidemics, global overpopulation, erosion of the soil, mass extinction of living species. This will be our burden, they tell us. Everything must do their part if we want to save our beautiful model of civilization. We have to consume a little less to be able to keep consuming. We have to produce organically to keep producing. We have to control ourselves to go on controlling. This is the logic of a world straining to maintain itself while giving itself an air of historical rupture. This is how they would like to convince us to participate in the great industrial challenges of this century. And in our bewilderment, we're ready to leap into the arms of the very same ones who presided over the devastation in the hopes that they will get us out of it. So right, for them, crises are used as pretenses to increase consolidation and state domination. Think of the tremendous increase in the power of the state as a result of the Great Depression. You know, people depended on the state and... Of course, it was a state-caused problem because of this worldwide economy, which has, you know, certain spots where if you poke it just right, the whole thing will collapse. It's quite a precarious system, and even more so today with, for example, um, the 2008 financial crisis. So in these situations of, you know, when when we were beholden to our environment and we have no choice, you know, of course we'll come crawling back to the state, like uh, one wouldn't expect otherwise. But for example, in environmentalism, it's a question of restoring the environment to a sustainable point, as long as that sustainable point allows corporations to, you know, get good standing in the media and among their consumers and continue to produce and their consumers continue to consume. Because the reality is, like they said, because this crisis doesn't really affect most people, most people, all they need to hear about is that there is a crisis coming, but that we've got a plan in place. And when that plan is in place, people will gladly go right back into their same, you know, consumerist habits. They will gladly reproduce the same cliches, They'll gladly stay in their same niches. And as a result, this is a wonderful phrase they say here, everything is permitted to a power structure that bases its authority in nature, in health, and in well-being. So, right, all it takes is making it sound like the benevolent authority is acting in your self-interests and in the self-interests of nature and in the self-interests of society as a whole. And once you do that, you can get Nazism, you can get fascism, you can get, you know, whatever you, like Italian fascism, you can get anything you want if you feel like your benevolent leader is acting for the right purposes. And they mention that the greatest wave of famine ever known in the tropics, 1876 to 1879, coincided with a global drought, but more significantly, it also coincided with the apogee of colonization. The destruction of the peasants' world and of local elementary practices meant the disappearance of the means for dealing with scarcity. And what's being referred here is the Great Famine of 1876-78, to 78, 
and this took place in India during the time of the British rule, and it started in the south and southeast in like Bombay, and went all the way up to the north in touch like Punjab, which touches Pakistan, and there were an estimated 8.2 million deaths in this two-year period. And really what happened is looking at kind of the historical precedent for this, the vulnerability that people were in as a result served as a pretext for increasing colonialism. This act as this acted as some sort of reason of, oh, you need our help more than ever. You need our colonial magistrates more than ever. And also, if you look at some of the British correspondence around this famine, for example, there was a famine that had happened about 10 years earlier, a little less than 10 years earlier. And as a response to that famine, they tightened their requirements for aid because they were giving people too much aid because that aid was allowing people to stay stable enough. So they had to give a little bit less aid to people struggling such that people would need to come crawling back to the colonial authority. So as they say, inhabiting a nowhere makes us vulnerable to the slightest jolt in the system, to the slightest climactic risk. And there's kind of a twofold nature to that, you know. It's a vulnerable position, so it, it makes us more willing to accept our own oppression. And it also makes us more attuned to real-world suffering. So there's kind of an optimism and a pessimism kind of coexisting here. And they write, any loss of control would be preferable to all the crisis management scenarios they envision. And this is very similar to a statement that Baudrillard made, which was something along the lines of war may be preferable to a police state that could ensure war never occurs. Something along that lines of, well, a little bit of struggle would be better than a police state that could ensure struggle never happens, because what would that mean? And then in the seventh circle, we are building a civilized space here. They say, freedom is no longer a name scrawled on walls, for today it is always followed, as if by its shadow, with the word security. And it is well known that democracy can be dissolved in pure and simple emergency edicts. For example, in the official reinstitution of torture in the U.S., or in France's Parabon II law. And what they're referring to here is, of course, as Guantanamo Bay was being built on this crisis pretext of the war on terror, the U.S. started extraditing people into Guantanamo Bay with little to no evidence of any kind. Often it was confessions, quote-unquote, or intelligence, quote-unquote, derived under duress from prisoners who had been tortured, and thus this pretext kind of, you know, snowballed into this mass array of intelligence that would be used as a pretext for further invasion in the Middle East. But there were official laws that were put into the books that allowed for the uses of enhanced interrogation techniques, quote unquote. And it was just torture. I mean, it was, you know, waterboarding, among other things, and you know, slapping and all this other stuff. And the authorities would claim, well, what do we really mean by torture? What do we really mean by, you know, all this stuff? I mean, technically, we're only allowed to slap them with the open hand on the cheek or on the stomach, and we're only allowed to waterboard them in such and such a way. Like, try getting waterboarded and tell me it's not torture. Um, and the Parabon II law is a law introduced in France in 2004 that targets quote, organized crime and delinquency, and allows for sentencing without trial. And, you know, this is just like um, in Guantanamo Bay. They just wouldn't convict the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay. And by the way, they wouldn't call them prisoners, because if they had to call them prisoners, then they would have to give them rights, so they called them detainees. And people could just stay there for like 14 years, like Muhammadu. Old Slahi, the 
Mauritania. It's a great movie and book on that. Um, you could just hold people without trial. So, right, you've got freedom and democracy, and you fight for freedom and democracy, but it's even using that phrase, you know, you can cause all sorts of damage. But add in security, and you can justify virtually anything. They write, there is no clash of civilizations. There is a clinically dead civilization kept alive by all sorts of life support machines that spread a peculiar plague into the planet's atmosphere. And right, this has some of those ecological connotations of, you know, the effects we're having on our environment, but also just a fact of like, what are we really working towards? This sort of, oh, let's increase lifespans for forever. Let's increase quality of life. Really, the Invisible Committee and a lot of these left-wing authors are asking, well, at what cost? What are we going towards? You know, what, what does this sort of global integration of the world mean for the state of actual freedom? And as such, the Invisible Committee seeks to understand what the coming insurrection looks like. So I hope this has been helpful for understanding this text. Definitely read it. It's really short. You can finish it in, you know, a few days if you're like me and you read kind of slowly. Check out any of my other lectures I've done on postmodernism, German idealism, gender theory, other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs once a month. That's it, and I'll see you in another lecture.